At this year's World Badminton Championships, Se Sung Jae of Korea did something that was not only truly remarkable, but something which had only ever been achieved four previous times by male players across a 46 year period, and something which hadn't been done since 1999. What Se Sung Jae did was win both the men's doubles world title and the mixed doubles world title at the same world championships. In badminton, we call that the doubles double. Now, becoming a world champion in any sport is an incredible achievement and deserves a whole lot of praise. It is the culmination of a whole career's worth of effort, dedication and determination to become the best of the best, to reach the pinnacle of your chosen sport. So to achieve that in two different disciplines at the same world championships, well, you certainly don't need me to point out how remarkable that really is. But what truly elevates this achievement goes beyond how rare it is or how long it has been since the last player did it. Because the doubles double as a whole in badminton is something which since the turn of the century, especially in the last 10-15 years, has diminished considerably. In fact, it has gone from a feat that, across the top 10 tournaments to make up the current world tour, happened 22 times between 2000 and 2010, but since has dropped considerably to only 4 times. When I found out these figures, it certainly piqued my interest, with the burning question being why? Why has there been such a sharp drop off in the last decade or so? So I decided to look into it. I wanted to look beyond just the obvious reason of it is too hard to do both these days. And as I looked deeper, a picture started to emerge. A story behind it all that could go some way to explaining why the doubles double has become so rare. And until Se Sung Jae did it, it was seen as impossible at the highest tournaments in this day and age. And let me tell you, whilst the fatigue answer will play a part, there is far more to it than that. I am starting this story in 1976, more specifically at the All England Championships. And I start here not because this is where the story necessarily starts, but to really hammer home a point. A point that, in the early days of badminton, it wasn't too uncommon to see players play all three events. And at these 1976 All England Championships, Gillian Jilks achieved one of badminton's greatest ever feats when she won all three disciplines. And that's it. What a tremendous day for Gillian Jilks. The singles title, the ladies doubles title, and now the mixed doubles title. And that's three virtual world titles in one day. This was, and still is, a phenomenal feat. It is only one of two times in all of badminton history I could find where a player has managed to win all three disciplines at the same major badminton tournament. But like I said, this sums up the times, in the 1970s and from badminton before. You still had clear single stars and double stars, but more often than not, most of the singles players doubled up to either play doubles or mixed. For example, Rudy Hartono, an Indonesian legend who is most well known for the player who won the most All England men's singles titles with eight, also reached the final of the men's doubles at the All England in 1971. Liam Sui King, another Indonesian men's singles legend, was a two-time world championship men's singles silver medalist. But in 1985, he also won bronze at the world championships in the men's doubles. And it wasn't just Indonesian players. Morten Frost is a Danish legend regarded as one of the greatest players of his generation. He reached the final of the men's doubles at the 1984 European Championships. But this trend of playing all three was definitely more common amongst the female players. I've already given the example of Gillian Jilks and her 1976 All England treble, but a year later, Lene Copen of Denmark won both the women's singles and the mixed doubles at the same World Championships. As we moved into the 1980s, with it started the modern era of badminton. The BWF unified with the WBF, and all the current nations of today began competing in the same tournaments. But whilst this was a big change, what didn't change was the trend of players playing across multiple disciplines. In fact, some of China's top stars, most notably their women, were highly successful in both the singles and doubles events. Han Ai-ping and Li Lengwei are two notable examples. Between them, they won four consecutive World Championship Women's Singles titles. And in that time, they also reached two consecutive doubles finals as a pairing in both 1985 and 1987, winning the 1985 final. But getting back to the topic of both doubles events, in the 1980s the mixed doubles event was still seen as a bit of an extra. The singles events were generally the main star, then the levels doubles events, and the mix was something that if you were good at doubles then you could probably succeed at mix too. 
But towards the end of the 1980s, something happened. Something that would change the entire landscape of badminton forever, and unbeknownst to everyone at the time, would change the course of the mixed doubles discipline. For the Olympic venues, this is your first welcome to Seoul National University Gymnasium, scene of badminton. This year, an exhibition sport in 1992, a full medal sport in the Olympics. In 1988, badminton was included as a demonstration event at the Seoul Olympics. This was huge for Babington, but it almost didn't happen as the BWF was asked to brunt a lot of the costs, something it wasn't willing and likely able to do. To get around this, the whole tournament was held in one day with limited participants. Imagine that, you had to play a whole tournament, the Olympics no less, in one day. Crazy. But anyway, whilst this is crazy, the Babington event was fortunate enough to go ahead, and with drawing in a crowd of 2,890 spectators, combined with the top stars of the time participating, it was seen as a success. It must be noted that it had already been decided by the IOC two years previous in 1986 that Bampton was to be included on the full Olympic program in 92, but the success of this one-day Olympics for Bampton certainly cemented that. And it's that decision that I feel is the first thing that changed the Bampton landscape forever, and with it had an effect on the doubles disciplines. This change would not be felt for quite some time, and I will come back to it later in the video, but there was one change it most certainly made quickly, and that was the clear specialisation of singles players and doubles players. Do you remember how I started this video talking about players playing both singles and doubles? Well, once badminton became an Olympic sport, that as good as stopped. To show this clearly, in the 1980s at tournaments equivalent to Super 500 and above, 50 times players won two events at the same tournament. Of those 50, 17 of them were done by players winning singles and doubles. In the 1990s, this doubling up at the same level tournament happened 37 times. The number of times this was achieved through singles and doubles? Only once. Winning the singles and doubles at the same tournament went from happening 34% of the time in the 1980s to just under 3% in the 1990s. That was the immediate effect the Olympics had. But whilst it had an effect on singles and doubles specificity, it didn't have an immediate effect on mixed doubles specificity. And this was for the simple reason that at the 92 Olympics, mixed doubles was not included. The reason for this was that because tennis and table tennis didn't have mixed events, the IOC felt Babinson shouldn't either. But regardless of this decision by the IOC, the Olympics created an even bigger divide between what it took to be the world's best at singles and the world's best at doubles. But this lack of effect on the mixed discipline was not to be unfelt for long, as by the 96 Olympics, things changed. At the 96 Olympics, mixed doubles was introduced, and boy did it have quite an immediate effect. As soon as the next year's World Championships, you started to see the emergence of mixed specialists. Lu Yong, Trikit Argento, and Michael Sogard are three very good examples. Well, I say specialists with a slight pinch of salt, it's not as if they didn't play doubles and weren't somewhat successful in that discipline, but their biggest successes and what they are known for today is mixed doubles. And why that's important to this whole story is that really they are the first players where this was the case. Before them, players, especially male players, weren't known as just mixed players, they were known as doubles players. Those three I just mentioned, mixed is where they saw the most success. Liu Yong was the 97 world champion, Trikus won the Olympic silver in 2000, and Michael Sogar was a three-time world bronze medalist and a four-times European champion. Now, of course, you still had some that did both, with the most noted example being Kim Dong Moon. He was a doubles double legend, and almost did it at free will. But other than players like him, it was clear that Mix was starting to split itself away from level doubles. And it was becoming its own discipline that required its own attention, and so trying to do both and be successful at both was becoming increasingly difficult. With that being said, however, the doubles double was still as common amongst badminton tournaments as it had ever been. For mixed doubles to truly break away, there was something else that was needed, and come the turn of the century, that was about to happen. With one nation in particular really taking to mixed doubles and changing it forever. China, they are the powerhouse of badminton. And they have kind of been that since the start. Ever since they joined the BWF in the early 80s, they have been by far the most dominant nation, especially in both men's and women's singles events and women's doubles. The two disciplines where they weren't quite as dominant was the men's doubles and, as you might expect, the mixed doubles. 
Seeming as this video is based on a world championship result, then let me use that tournament to show this to you. China first participated in the world championships in 1983. Between those 1983 world championships and the 1999 world championships, this is how many medals they won across the five disciplines. Men's singles, 10. Women's singles, 25. Men's doubles, 7. Women's doubles, 17. And mixed doubles, 8. So from that, whilst their mix might have produced one more medal than their men's doubles, in terms of finalists, they only had two in the mixed doubles compared to four in the men's doubles. But this point is kind of mute. I think it highlights enough that mixed doubles was one of the disciplines where China was not dominating. But that, as the new century rolled around, was about to change. It was in the 2000s that China started to truly dominate the whole badminton landscape, with this domination culminating with four incredibly impressive clean sweeps at major tournaments. The 2009 All England Clean Sweep, the 2010 and 2011 World Championships Clean Sweep, and the 2012 Olympic Games Clean Sweep. And to me, I feel a big part of this complete domination by China can be linked to them specialising in mixed doubles. In the 2000s, especially in their male players, you saw mixed specialists form. Players like Zhang Jun. Zhang was the first of China's mixed men from this time. He did play some men's doubles, but quickly became a mixed specialist. He won two consecutive Olympic titles in 2000 and 2004, a world title in 2001, as well as three All Englands. From Zhang Jun sprung others like Ji Zhongbo, Zheng Bo, He Han Bin, and Zhang Nan, who in the 2000s and into the 2010s continued China's success in the mixed doubles discipline. This specialization is something that is still going very strong today, with players like Zheng Si Wei, a three time world champion and 2020 Olympic silver medalist, Wang Yilu, the 2020 Olympic champion, and even newcomers like Feng Yang Zhe and Jiang Zheng Bang, only focusing on the mixed doubles discipline with plenty of early success. What this specialization and domination by China in the mixed doubles discipline did was force the other nations to have to focus their efforts too. Now, I'm not saying that China were the only ones doing this. Indonesia were another nation highly successful, and so were Denmark. Funnily enough, the three nations from which those original male mixed specialists I mentioned earlier came from, the reason I mention China more than the others is because not only did they produce the most mixed specialists, but also since the turn of the century, they have produced the most major champions. Using the World Championships as my reference point again, since 2000s, there have been 17 editions of the World Championships. China has won almost half of the mixed titles with eight. The next closest is Indonesia with half that at four. What all this means and the point I'm trying to make is just like in the early 90s where you saw a clear divide between the singles and doubles disciplines form, Throughout the 2000s and into the 2010s, you saw the same with level and mixed doubles, with both events becoming more and more specialised, to a point where trying to succeed at both at the same time became almost impossible. This can be clearly seen in the stats too. In the 2000s, across all 30 tournaments that make up the current World Tour, the doubles double was done 79 times. In the 2010s, across the same 30 tournaments, that number more than halved to 38. Now, 38 may still seem like quite a high number. You might be thinking, that really doesn't prove my point. But when you look at only the highest level tournaments, then the figures become even more stark and apparent. If I take just the top 10 tournaments, the World Tour Super 750 and above, then in the 2000s, the doubles double was done 22 times. That makes up 28% of the total across all 30. In the 2010s, at the same level of tournaments, the doubles double happened only three times. From comparison, that is only 8% of the total across all 30 tournaments. What this means is that whilst doubling up may have been happening a fair bit across all badminton tournaments, at the very highest level of badminton it was hardly happening at all. Now, in my opinion, China has played a pivotal role in all of this. There's also another huge factor that I need to address. It is the one that I mentioned earlier, and it underpins everything that I have said, as well as gives context to some other reasons for this change. And that is the Olympic effect. I've already mentioned in this video the effect the Olympics has had on badminton. The 92 Olympics, with its lack of a mixed event, created a clear divide between singles and doubles players, one that has only got bigger over time. And then the 96 Olympics, which included mixed doubles, birthed the emergence of mixed doubles specialists, which started a gradual drift between levels doubles players and mixed doubles players. The attributes and skills required changed, as well as being a catalyst for China to specialise in the mixed doubles. 
But the Olympics and Badminton's inclusion in it also had another effect, and that was the broadening and deepening of Badminton's overall level. You see, once Badminton became an Olympic sport, it inevitably got more nations interested in it. And on top of this, it gave Badminton an even bigger prize, to be Olympic champion. The pinnacle in pretty much all sports. What this inevitably did was increase the interest in people wanting to become Badminton players, which in turn not just increased the depth of Badminton, but also the strength. But this was a gradual increase. It was one that took 20 years or more to be seen. And I feel we saw the culmination of it in the 2010s, maybe most specifically with Ratchnik Interland's World Championship win in 2013. This win by Ratchnik is often cited to many as the result that changed the course of women's singles, moving it away from a China-dominated discipline to one of the most diverse in all of Badminton. But I feel this win also highlighted how Badminton as a whole had changed, and it was the culmination of that gradual change ever since Badminton entered the Olympics in 1992. Now, you might not agree with me there, but since the 2013 Worlds, we have seen a whole emergence of things that before would have seemed impossible. A world and Olympic champion coming from Spain. The Thomas Cup being won by five different nations in five editions played. Thailand defeating China at a Uber Cup. And France becoming one of Europe's leading nations. I could go on, but what it clearly shows is that over the last decade, Bams has become so much more diverse and so much deeper in quality. And it's like diversity and depth that has also had an effect on players playing more than one event, most specifically the doubles and mixed doubles. Because with both these things means that, in general, tournaments on the whole have become harder, especially physically, to win. That's not to say tournaments were easy before, but it's so more common these days to see insane first and second rounds compared to those of 15 to 20 years ago. This reason is the one that most people will cite as the main reason that there are far less players not just winning two events at the same tournament, but playing two events at the same tournament. But I hope I have given it a bit more nuance and context. However, physicality is not the only reason that has sprung from this increased diversity and depth, and I want to go over that now as I conclude this whole story. Okay, before I get to that, let me recap very quickly for you. Badminton in the early days was not overtly specific when it came to the different disciplines, with many players playing multiple events. The 80s hit, the modern era started, things didn't really change until the end of the decade when Badminton became an Olympic sport. This inclusion created a clearer divide between singles and doubles players, but not so much mixed as it wasn't included in the 92 Olympics. Following the 96 Olympics where mixed was included, we saw the emergence of mixed specialists. Following the turn of the century, China really started to specialise in all disciplines, subsequently creating many mixed superstars who helped them dominate the discipline. By the 2010s, the overall effect from Bamson becoming an Olympic sport was felt with far more diversity and depth. All of this combined not only helped Bamson evolve as a whole, but it made each individual discipline so much more unique, which in turn made it increasingly difficult to be the best of the best in more than one of them. This had a knock-on effect in terms of the physicality, not just in winning a tournament, but also the training for so, overall, badminton has evolved, like any other sport, but the inclusion of the Olympics certainly sped things up and affected the sport in a number of other ways too. But to me, that doesn't quite fully answer the question I posed at the start. Why has there been such a sharp decline in the last decade or so in terms of doubling up? The last part of my answer is, what happens when everything gets ramped up? The specificity, the diversity, the depth, the physicality. Well, the overall level of that discipline also goes up. And that in turn feeds into a cycle, as the specificity increases, the strength and depth increases, and the physicality increases, so does the overall level, which in turn drives the others to increase more, and so on. And that gives us the real reason why we don't see players doubling up much anymore, is that there simply isn't the time to do so. The time to train for more than one discipline, the time to train with more than one partner, the time to prepare for more than one match, the time to recover between those matches. If you spread yourself too thin, you simply won't be able to keep up with everyone else. And as a result, you can't become the best of the best. So, with all that in mind, it really does make what Saison Jay achieved at this year's World Championships absolutely ridiculous. A feat which, if I hadn't witnessed it, I would have felt impossible. And that's it for yet another video. A bit of a different one this time, with a topic that I understand could have differing viewpoints on. With that being said, feel free to get in the comments and let me know what you think. Whether you agree or disagree, 
doesn't really matter. Now, I know it's been a little longer in between uploads this time, but moving forward, this is going to be the norm. I will be uploading videos every two to three weeks with much more of a focus on quality over quantity. I hope you can understand and will continue to support me. If you like what I'm doing here, then please feel free to subscribe and also hit the notification bell so that you are notified of when my next video comes out. Until then, feel free to watch more of the videos I've already created. Two of them are right here. Until then, everyone, I'm Ben Beckman. I'll see you next time.